Okay, so take you through a little history, which most of you probably know. Um, with the emergence of the next-gen sequencing technologies uh, several years ago, um, it got to the point where you could do really amazing science at scale uh, for the first time uh, with sequencing. Um, but it, it's progressed to the point where you can generate almost limitless numbers of 300 or so base pair pieces of DNA at quite high raw accuracy coming out of the instrument. With the emergence of a few years ago of the long read technologies, we could extend the read length a lot, 20 KB up to hundreds of KB, at the penalty of having noisy reads. So what I'm gonna to try to take you through is that's no longer a limitation necessarily of long read sequencing technologies. And the reason it's not in the, in the context of the smart sequencing is that the templates start off as a piece of linear double-stranded DNA. By ligating on hairpin adapters to each end, you convert that into topologically a circle. That means that you can start at one of those hairpin sites as a, a primer binding uh, initiation point um, and go around that circle as many times as the polymerase will stay active. And that allows us to then take that individual read, the individual passes down one of the, the strands, the forward or reverse of your template, um, allow you to create consensus accuracy at a high level from a single DNA molecule that you've sequenced multiple times. And that means that if you do it a few times, since the errors in our system are quite random, you build up a high consensus accuracy on an individual molecule. It can get up to the Q30 or higher uh, level for that, that molecule. Um, if you do it in a context of the, the system that, that most people have available to them now, uh, it allows you to generate reads that in one sense are in excess of 250 kilobases of DNA, um, but they're done on a template that's a relatively defined size in the sort of 10 to 20 KB range. And you can generate a fair amount of the subread data and then the process CCS data out of that. That means that you can now think about having NGS level quality individual reads that are 100 or more times the size of what you get with typical NGS work. And we think that that can change the paradigm of how to use uh, long read technology for doing genomic analysis. So th the way we chose to demonstrate this initially was to take some of the reference samples from the Genome in a Bottle program and carry out the sequencing of these things so that we could compare them from the perspective of being able to pick out variation and so forth uh, and the ability to do assembly uh, compared to uh, what you do with typical long reads uh, that have the noisy characteristic that uh, all of us are familiar with. So the, one of the first experiments we did was to take a relatively carefully, narrowly sized selected library um, sheared from a Coriel sample of HG002 um, at around 13 and a half KB or so. Um, process it on the smart sequencing system um, to generate a set of data uh, with an average QV just under uh, Q30, um, but with QV extending from 20 all the way out on individual reads to, to QV50 if they happen to go really long. The question is, what can you do with that? Well, the first thing that we looked at was doing genome assembly. Um, and this is a case where in the processing of the data, uh, using uh, largely in this particular example, canoe uh, and the ability to do uh, trio bending, um, and you can very easily not only generate the assembly, but with that phase the two haplotypes quite well and get quite contiguous and relatively complete genome assemblies. And I've compared them here to the um, a similar experiment, but done with noisy long reads <coughs> on, a, on a, a different one of the uh, genome in a bottle samples. On top of that, you get uh, contiguity that's roughly the same in this particular case. And this was done at about, I believe, 28x unique coverage uh, of the sequencing. And you can get very high consensus accuracy, actually higher consensus accuracy than you can get anywhere near these levels of coverage. And the l coverage level in the uh, CLR one, or the continuous long reads, um, was about 70 to 80x coverage compared to the 28x unique coverage 
uh, with the CCS processing. Um, at the same time, you can look at that from the context of how much of the DNA that you sequenced is really high accuracy. And this kind of course correlates to the, um, the accuracy at the overall level of Q48. But it also means that if you break your contigs into 100 KB chunks, 50% of those are perfect down that whole 100 KB piece of DNA. Um, different, obviously, from CLR. And in the same process, the, some of the bioinformatics people had looked at, um, at ONT data with and without Illumina data. Um, and just to show that, that, that you can get a good assemblies with any of these from a contiguity perspective, the quality at the base level can be quite different. Um, one of the things that you can see is you can detect structural variants quite easily, pointing out here that not only can you see the structural variants, but if you look closely, it's very easy to phase the haplotypes in, in the regions here. And that's why even in the trial bending process, you could get really good um, contiguity overall and completeness of the sequence. With short reads, particularly in regions where you have um, repeat structures, which are indicated by the bar at the, the bottom, you frequently miss deletions like this and other things. If you look at it from the perspective of structural variants overall, uh, we were able to get quite good um, both recall and precision, um, both for uh, deletions and insertions here, um, compared to certainly what you can get with short read data, uh, particularly an improvement relative to the insertions. Um, surprisingly, to some level, uh, you also get quite good performance relative to looking at individual single nucleotide changes, either uh, substitutions or very short indels. And this is a case, again, indicated by the arrows, where you can quite easily see uh, differences relative to what you would have seen from the short read data in some cases, but more importantly, very clearly distinguish the haplotypes uh, in the phasing. Um, and so we look collectively at the, at the small variants, um, both indels and uh, single nucleotides. And the first processing that we did was using GATK, um, which is a fairly standard tool for doing that. Um, and we got reasonably good results compared to what you get with short read data, uh, at least for the, the mismatches. Not so good for the small indels, which predominantly um, are harder for any long read technology particularly around uh, uh, shorter, medium-sized uh, homopolymers. So what we did realize, however, is that the error profiles between short read data and long read data can be quite different. Most of the errors that you can see, or are, are you going to call errors or discordances, with short reads are mismatches, whereas the error profile for the, the long read technologies uh, invariably are around short indels. And so since the GAT key model was really built around the short reads and the kind of error model that you had there, we wanted to look carefully at whether or not using a different model for how to process the data would give you different results. And we collaborated with the deep variant group at Google um, to use their machine learning techniques to kind of remodel the data uh, for this. And the conclusion to that is that made a big difference because the GT key models, as good as they are for the short reads, really aren't tuned to the characteristics of the long reads. So if you look at that and just compare the two, what you see is a, a reasonably good improvement on the single nucleotide mismatches, and you see a much bigger increase in performance uh, relative to the small indels. Um, what that means is that we were actually able, uh, we, um, uh, Justin Wagner and Justin Zook at NIST have been able recently, and they presented it at a poster a few days ago, able to actually go through the genome in a bottle uh, high confidence call and correct a reasonable number of what were thought to be high confidence mismatch calls in the genome in a bottle uh, reference. On top of that, because we can map much more carefully the longer insert reads relative to the two or 300 base pair reads, uh, we could actually begin to identify high quality calls 
outside the region that short reads were able to work on. And their estimates, and they're still going through this, is they were uh, able to do a little over 150,000 new high quality calls on mismatches um, that they were not able to have in their reference before. And more importantly, about f that represents about a 5% increase in variance, reliably callable, uh, and medically related and important uh, genes. Okay, so we, we took then a set of 193 um, medically important genes that were uh, listed in a publication a year or so ago um, that were defined as not being reliably analyzed by short read data alone. Um, and in looking at the assembly data, over three-fourths of those were able to be called reliably completely with this data. Another set called partially, and then a few ones, um, and you'll, if you can read the slide, notice some of the usual characters um, that were still difficult to call. If you take the data that's there, because it's all there, and process it a little differently than just a straight canoe assembly, um, you actually can fish out those data. And this is SMN1 and 2, a notoriously difficult region in which you can not only pick out the difference between um, the, the gene and its pseudogene, but also phase the two alleles in both cases. Um, the other thing that we've done is looked at, well, how much coverage do you need to do all this stuff? Um, and I'll go through these pretty quickly because they all wind up being about the same from a perspective of concordance and um, contiguity. And we've defined it as concordance because the reference is, is obviously under change right now. Um, you get where you need to get to uh, pretty well at about 15 or 16x unique coverage. Um, for structural variants, it's about the same thing. Um, for small variant calling, um, it's the, certainly the same for single nucleotides, and as we continue to process it, we think it'll get the same way for indels. And if those of you are old enough to realize or remember Smith-Waterman, it's about what would be predicted if you got good random uh, generation of DNA uh, in your experiments. Okay, so that's where we got started, and then we went to, okay, that's great, but it still takes a lot of effort to generate enough sequence to get up to those levels sometimes. Uh, with our newer technology, which we're, is, is now in, in, in beta, um, we can increase the throughput of the cells by a factor of eight, simply by putting more reaction wells in the chip. Um, you get data that looks very similar, it's just there's eight times as much of it per cell. Um, and somewhat surprisingly, it's actually it's a slightly different chemistry that's used. Um, you get to a high level of accuracy, and we're defining that at the minimum of, of Q30, um, at substantially less times around the circle, um, or fewer uh, times around the circle than we got with the other system. Um, so we did the same processing, and we looked just at the analysis here at 16x coverage. You get similar assembly, um, similar uh, concordance. Um, you get uh, the same kind of structural variant precision and recall. Um, and you actually get improved um, precision and recall um, on the... Um, again, the structural variant, or the single nucleotide type variants, partly because you get to a high level of, of consensus uh, with fewer uh, uh, overlaps. Um, and then, um, interestingly with this, again, it was designed to kind of improve on the indel a little bit. You get much better performance um, on the, uh, the, the indel analysis. Okay, so that's kind of where we, we are with the technology. You can, you can uh, look at it as a way of converting long, noisy reads to fairly long, but high accuracy reads. And that can change the way that you analyze the data. The tools that we've been using up to now are the same kind of tools that have been applied to short read data for a long time, tweaked a little bit to the fact that they're just starting with bigger pieces of DNA. There's a lot that we have to do in terms of being able to speed up some of the processing of the upfront CCS process. Once you get to that, the assemblies are very fast, much faster than what you see with long, uh, noisy reads. Uh, and as we increase the speed of the enzyme that we can use in a system, 
you can extend the length of the insert pieces of DNA, and we've gone up to about 20 KB as the inserts. The data I showed you was about 13 or so. So, so let me tease you with, uh, well, let me remind you of the fact that a lot of people went into this analysis. Uh, there are 19 authors on there from almost a dozen different institutions that have applied their expertise in assembly algorithms and structural variant analysis and uh, small variant analysis to the process to help do it. Um, it's posted on BioArchive. Uh, you're welcome to, to pull that up uh, to go through the gory detail uh, of the first pass analysis of this. But from a teaser, we try to say, does it work on something besides human, which is fairly well characterized? The answer is yes. Um, we've tried it on uh, some plants as well as um, some fish. Uh, it works equally well in both in terms of, you know, sort of the typical characteristics at a growth scale on assembly. Um, the real issue is could we do something you couldn't do with long, noisy reeds? And that was to say, can we begin to look at centromeres? It's a little surprising that you might be able to think you could even do that with pieces of DNA that are 10 to, in this case, 15 KB long. Turns out you can. Um, this is a case where we took um, a Cabernet Sauvignon that had been sequenced uh, with long reeds and then scaffolded um, with some other technology into kind of two scaffolds that had a big gap in the middle in terms of anything but ends. Um, in the course of the analysis, there was one 4.2 meg contag, um, this is on chromosome seven, I think. Um, you get similar results in some of the other chromosomes um, that seemed to span that gap. The question is, what was that? Dot plot analysis is kind of interesting. It's obviously going through a very highly repetitive region. Um, and we think that obviously when you go through the sequence, um, as is done here, um, you can begin to see as you scan through it all kinds of interesting uh, repetitive uh, regions in there with the analysis. Um, and it has all the kind of sequences you would expect for a centromere. Now, we don't think we can do this with this size piece of DNA yet for human-sized DNA, but the data's there, the right kind of processing we think gets there. And with that, I'll stop. Fantastic, we have time for a quick question. Uh, if not, maybe I'll ask. So, so one of the other, you know, fascinating, well, one of the advantages of the PAC biosystem is its ability to detect epigenetic modifications. I'm yep. wondering if the CCS technology gives you better accuracy or higher accuracy in uh, methylation detection. Good question, and the answer is yes, and we've known that from day one. We didn't used to do CCS in which we could get enough passes around the thing to be able to do it, but since you know exactly that you're dealing with the same sequence and you're not trying to overlap things that are different, it's actually much easier to get there at a high confidence level than it is where you're doing an intermolecular comparison to do that. Fantastic, looking forward to it. All right, please join me in uh, thanking Dr. Hunkerpiller for a fantastic talk. Our next speaker uh, this evening is George Seal.